Amen. Mm-hmm. 
everyone. Welcome to Living Word Worship Center. It's a beautiful Sunday morning here, and uh, just briefly uh, thank all of you for coming, for sure, but uh, to, re to remind you of uh, Sylvia's announcement there, December 9th is the ladies' Christmas party here at the church, 6 to 9 p.m. Also, Sunday, December 11th, uh, dur during the worship service here is our annual Christmas program and then following that on December 11th uh, is our annual uh, Christmas banquet at Crystal Garden and we certainly want everyone uh, to attend to that and you'll notice or maybe you won't notice I'll just tell you because <laughs> I have a bulletin you probably don't uh, December 11th is the annual Christmas banquet. And the way that works briefly is this. Um, we reserve the room uh, for 150 people and that's what we pay. We write a check and we pay for it. That's it. If there's more than that, there's plenty of food. You, we just pay the extra. They count heads after the dinner and we just write the check. So the cost of the dinner is about $24, but there's no charge to anyone directly. If you'd like to contribute or help or maybe Whatever you'd like to do is fine, that's up to you. No one will ever know whether you did or not. There are no tickets, you just show up and have a nice meal. This is one thing I really enjoy, one of the many things I really enjoy doing for the people. Usually when the church says come and you're gonna have a good time, there's probably gonna be vacuuming and washing dishes. and So none of that. You, you just sit down and, and eat and have a good time of fellowship at least this one time. Uh, during the Christmas season. I encourage everyone to come. Whether, whether we have less than 150 doesn't matter. We pay for 150, so I don't want to have less than that. And I'd be very happy to have more than that, be more than happy to pay. Amen? Amen? So God bless you and thank you for that. No matter what anybody else told you, that's the truth. Okay, and just one more announcement I'll make. Uh, on uh, November 27th, um, I will be doing a memorial tribute here in the um, worship service for at, at the latter part of the service for Edmund Mazik, who passed away uh, a couple of months ago now. As if Those of you probably remember, most of you, we did that for Brian Pinner uh, when he passed, and it's, it's really a nice service and a nice tribute for them, so that'll be on the 27th of November. And... Uh, so from there, I would like to uh, make reference to our beautiful display here that uh, Brenda set up last night for the veterans, all the veterans. I want to wish you all the veterans a happy Veterans Day, of course. That was a couple days ago on Friday, or I think it was Friday the 11th. And uh, this little uh, display we have here is, uh, was contributed to me in a way by uh, John Heidenreich. Most of you know him as the saluting sailor who is, uh, he's located on uh, Eureka Road and Racco Road there in front of the Bubba's restaurant for five events a year, I believe it is now, at least four, maybe five. And uh, unfortunately, John had to work today and couldn't come because he usually comes and greet you guys and thanks you for your support. But for John, God bless you today and thank you for your service. And if you wanna feel free, you can just uh, look around there at the table. Everything that's there, John gave it to me and believe me, a whole room full of other stuff, too. Amen? Amen. Okay. So at this time, we're going to do um, our usual prayers for those who have requested it. And I want to begin just by reading those I have on my Facebook page. Although I do have to say I had some late, uh, <laughs> some late requests. And I'm good. so this is not all of them, but we'll start here. So from my Facebook uh, page, these are new requests since last uh, Wednesday evening for Robert Kirby Jr., for Amy Dudek, for Louie and Tina, for Sportster Ken, uh, for, for me and uh, for Brenda. Lots of prayers for her. She's a saint, two saints. Um, for Barb Andrew, who's doing well after her surgery, for Jimmy Estep, for Russ, for Violet, for Nolan, for Angie Wilson family, for Jeremy and his kids, for Diana family, Kelly and family, Don Lee, Willie J and Lisa, Lee Calusa, Wes and his mom, uh, CMA, Iron Saints it says, uh, Denise Kiros, I'm guessing Q-U-I-R-O-Z, 
Sally O'Mara's sister, Helen, I think is her name. And uh, for Helen, if that's a different one, for a Violet, Nolan, I think I may have said that twice. For Annie, Cecil, and Linda, and for Kip, Tyra. And if you'll bear with me just a moment, these were ones that didn't make the cut before, the <laughs> before we went to print. I will just mention that always on my Facebook page, anytime you go there, pinned at the top is this prayer post where all you have to do is type in whatever name you want. You don't have to send me a message to put you on there. You just put you on there. <laughs> just go directly there and uh, anybody can do it and put your name there and be happy to pray. And, and pr I promise you we do, believe me. And we do publicly here too on every occasion so far as long as we're able to keep up here. So I think uh, Angie Wilson, I don't know if I said that or not. Yeah, I did. Okay, so I have uh, Devin, Abby, Kayla, Greg Rhodes, Butch Taylor, Christian, Holly, and Grayson Johnson. Okay. This is a, okay, let's see. So we have Ian Garza, Chuck, Julia, Maximus, and Brady, the Case family, Carol Crowder, Boo Boo, Kathy, and uh, for Danny, Kim, Mary, and Lucy, for David, uh, Kat, and uh, Kathy again, for Jennifer, Tony, Terry Williams, Big Lou, and Mike, for the Webb family, Alicia, Kim, and, and mother. And for grandma, okay. And uh, Christian, Christopher, I'm sorry, and looks like Angie. And did I miss one? I think I have it. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. This is a little bit uh, cumbersome, and, but I think worthwhile, and so long as I still since that we're going to continue to do this because these prayers are important and they are effective and i would just add i would just add my personal commentary to that i never really uh, experienced personally you know since my recent injury all the prayer and support and so forth is such a powerful thing in in ways you didn't really think of it's not ask for this and you'll have it kind of thing there's just power in in the actual prayer itself it's very powerful. It's very powerful to know that and, and to be surrounded by that. I can't explain it exactly. I think you know what I'm talking about. But uh, let's all pray together, those of you remotely or viewing and those of you in the room. Our Father, we're so thankful today for this wonderful opportunity to come together in one mind, one accord, and just to see what you would show us today and hear what you would speak and and to open ourselves up to any and every change and all that you can possibly do in us in this brief time that we have. We ask blessings according to the, according to the way they have asked and believed and received and according to all that you know and do among us. We ask you to, we ask you to minister to all those who have been named here today and to all those who stand in support on their behalf. And may this day continue to reveal this wonderful person of Jesus Christ in new and different and profound ways in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Wow, what a wonderful day. I love this day. Seems like it's been a whole week since I was here. And uh, boy, what a long week. I think, um, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Dave and Lori there for uh, teaching on Wednesday night. That makes it a tremendous difference for me. It helps me uh, greatly uh, to be uh, relieved of that uh, extra work, I guess you could say at that time, but it blesses me by being under their ministry, and I appreciate that so much. I just love all you guys. You're so special. So thank you, honey. So Veterans Day, we're, it's a nod to all veterans today, and um, Veterans Day was originally called Armistice Day, first celebrated in 1921 to honor veterans of World War I. 
Armistice Day marked the cessation of hostilities on the Western Front of World War I. It first took effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. In 1954, President Eisenhower changed the name of Armistice Day to Veterans Day in honor of those who served, all those who served and died from all wars. This is for all veterans. And so if you wouldn't mind, I'm one, I'd like to ask that all veterans who are in the room would stand now and be acknowledged so we could give you a hand of appreciation. All of you just stand <laughs> and make you know. God bless you all. Wow, wow, wow. wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much. If you haven't noticed this back wall here, it's easy to be in a room and just not notice the details, but uh, this, this back wall in the sanctuary is dedicated to our veterans and to all of our military um, in every way. And it's such a beautiful display. I'm just so proud of it. And thank you guys for that. And uh, for all of you, thank you for your service, for your sacrifices, and your continuing patriotism of our great country. Now, just uh, have a last minute interjection here. <laughs> Seems like everything's last minute. But uh, we have a minute. So uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. Maybe you have, or maybe you are. But I read, I get like a daily devotional. Maybe it's, probably many of you have devotionals you read every day that come to you. And they're very inspiring, and uh, that's the whole point. Uh, but I get one from uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon, and it's notes from him and so forth. And I get another one or two, which I love a lot. But, but he always, even though this is, this, it sounds passe or even dated sometimes in the language, the gospel is eternal and cannot be dated and can never be passe. The principles are there, the word is there, so I just want to read this and just say to you, he who has ears to hear, please hear. When I read this this morning as a routine devotional, I wasn't looking for more material to bring. I usually have more than I can use. But when that spoke to me in that way, I thought, thank you, Lord, for uh, speaking to us today. So I just read this and leave it with you. Is that good? It's called, it's brief, it's called Agreeing in the Lord. From Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, this is Paul saying, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche, this is two ladies, to agree in the Lord. They had issues between them. Yes, I ask you also, all of you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These were uh, Christian people. Many These were people who worked tirelessly, really, with Paul to help bring the gospel out. And there was apparently a dispute between these two women. So Paul took seriously reports that the two women in the Philippian fellowship had fallen out. He makes it clear that we are not our own. We belong to Christ. Paul pleads with Euodia and Syntyche to remember their unity in the Lord and to submit to God's word in the scriptures. When we forget that we belong exclusively to Christ, we will very quickly begin to champion our own agendas, establish our own causes, fight for our own personal rights, and get on our own high horses to dispute with anybody who doesn't agree with us. Dissension causes confusion and distractions by petty and peripheral concerns, sapping the spirituality of the arguers as well as all who are caught up in the dispute. It is utterly incongruous or inconsistent for us to insist on our own way when we belong to a savior who instructs otherwise. 
If Jesus, if Jesus had thought of himself in the way we so often and so easily think of ourselves, there would have been no incarnation, no cross, no forgiveness, and no hope of heaven for us. As Christians, we are to work through our disagreements with integrity. Whatever may divide, unity is stronger. Amen. So I'll leave that with you. It was directly from the Spirit of God. So the, the title of today's sermon, and as a nod to, fit, to uh, Veterans Day, is Fighting the Good Fight of Faith. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The fight of faith begins by changing the subject. You know, a fanatic is one who cannot change their mind but will not change the subject. So I don't ask you to change your mind because you know you're right. We all are. <laughs> the Bible says so. All of a man's ways are right in his own eyes. There's no one here who believes that they're wrong because that wouldn't be your belief then by definition. But we do have a spirit and a will, and if nothing else, at the very least, let us be wise, and at the right time and place and way, let us just change the subject and go on. How about that? The subject must change to salvation in His name with no strings attached. Whatever your agenda was, it's time to change. Whatever your cause was, there is but one cause. Whatever your agenda was, wherever your efforts were directed, whatever you were involved in, now there's one that rises above. The cause of this gospel as a believer is everything. Let us not forget that. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now this is a simple sentence here that Peter and, and the disciples uh, are recorded that they said in the book of Acts when they were thrown into prison really for preaching in Jesus' name. They're preaching to people who had worshipped, who had followed, I should say, Moses for many, many decades, for many generations. And now, this, now, the apostles, Peter and Paul and James and all the rest, are saying, no, now, there is salvation in no other name but Jesus, Jesus only. And when the people observed the power that came in that message and the result and the effect of that gospel that they had brought, when they observed that, the next verse said, and I think I mentioned it last week in verse 13, the next verse says, when they observed that these were unlearned, just regular, ordinary people, that they realized that this is not possible except for one thing. These people must have been with Jesus. Hanging out with Him will change you in a way that people will notice. People who have degrees, people who have very sophisticated uh, backgrounds and are very erudite and, and uh, just remarkably blessed people. Without the presence of God, all that you have falls on the floor in front of you. All that you hope for and aspire to is a dead end off of a cliff into a bottomless pit. Without Christ, we can do nothing. Without Christ, we are nothing. They had noticed that these people, these fishermen, they were just tent makers. Paul was a tent maker by trade. These were just regular people like us, but there was something so extraordinary about them, and it could only be explained in one way. These people had been with Jesus. If you want to be changed, 
You'll be changed by the company you hang out with, according to the company. John Wesley said this, October 6, 1774. Now, 1774 is like the infancy of our nation. You know that. He said this, just one sentence. He said a lot more, but just an excerpt. He said, I advise those who vote in the ensuing election to take care that their spirits are not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. No matter what, we are never justified nor permitted any spirit but other than the one God has granted to us. Period. All other spirits are unacceptable. And when men behave in unchristian-like ways toward other men for any reason, as the Bible says, they just don't realize what spirit they're of. We're not of that spirit. We're of God's spirit. Our spirit is from God and ought always to be consistent with His own spirit. It is important, very important, who is in the White House. It is important who is in power in the White House, in the State House, and in the Courthouse. But America's true power is in the Lord's house, in your house, and in my house. There's where we lack the power or gain the power. It's pointless. It's pointless to protest taking prayer out of schools when we ourselves don't pray in our homes. It's pointless to say you can't ban the Bible when we have never read one ourselves. It's hollow and vain. And the world knows. True power is in the heart of the believer. Second, Second Samuel chapter 23 verse 5 says this. Is not my house right with God? For he is established with me an everlasting covenant, ordered and secured in every part. Will he not bring about my full salvation and my every desire? Salvation is in no other name but Jesus Christ. Whatever your history is, whatever your background is, whatever your case is, contrary to that, is irrelevant. Christ is eternal. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is by himself plus nothing, the Savior of the entire world, and anyone who calls on his name from anywhere by any means will be saved before they finish their prayer. Amen. Don't make a religion out of it. We made a religion out of it that nobody can find God. We've, we've added so many layers and laminated him so deeply into the message. You can barely find Christ in most, in most, in a lot of sermons, I would say, in a lot of religious groups. But Christ ought to shine. He is the city himself that's on a hill that cannot be hidden. He is the beacon. He is the light. From him we are lit up inwardly. Christ is the gospel. There is no other gospel but Christ. It is the good news that Jesus saves, period. Ephesians 6, 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers the spiritual rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I repeat, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. If you're having a problem with somebody, ask yourself this question, do they have flesh and blood? If they do, that's not your problem. Your problem is inward, your problem is out there, the problem is spiritual, not fleshly. There is no right way to win the battle in the wrong arena. You can't be tough enough, big enough, smart enough, brilliant enough to win spiritual battles in any arena by the arm of the flesh. All flesh is flesh. Our battle is spiritual. We have the Spirit of God Himself. Every spirit yields to the Spirit of God. Every knee bows. Every tongue confesses. Jesus is Lord. Period. All your other artillery is just foolish weight. It's an anchor on your soul. Get rid of it 
go to Christ. Many talk about spiritual warfare. Every sentence, every other sentence, every other word. Spiritual warfare, this and that. But have no idea what's written in the Bible, what's written in the Constitution of the United States. They have no idea what's written in the Declaration of Independence or what it even is. And we go around parading and protesting and promenading around all of this stuff when we have no idea what we're even really talking about in too great a degree. Their argument is based on nothing more than what they hear on TV and what they see on Facebook, and therefore they go to war with this kind of armor. Or the classic statement, it's true, I heard it somewhere. It has to be true, I heard it. I've heard it all my life, it has to be true. If it is the Word of God, it is true forever. If the Word of God is ever true, it's true forever. If ever a man is contrary to that, let that man be a liar, let God be true. <laughs> we perish, my friends, for lack of knowledge. We are not equipped as we ought to be. Our equipping is from the Word of God, from the Spirit of God, from the name of Jesus Christ, and all the rest will fall flat in front of us, as I mentioned. From the fall of Adam, there's been a divided path throughout human history. There's a fork in the road at the beginning. Adam's first son, Cain, murdered his second son, Abel, over their differences. And that road has been divided ever since. Abel was a man of faith. Cain was a man of religious works. And they were irreconcilable even as they are today. A man does not make it to heaven by a combination of his good behavior and his belief in God. It is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God Period. Man is incurably religious until he finds this out. He will always endeavor to do better. He will always endeavor to try harder. He will always keep doing these things. But everyone, everyone who pursues this path of approval before God always ends the same way. They always end up dying trying. Christ has already died. So you can give up trying and start trusting what He is already offering to us for free. It is already accomplished. He already has it. The table is already spread. You're already invited. You don't need to do a thing but show up and just kiss His ring instead of the rings of men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The political, moral, and cultural divide is spiritual. Period. It is in that arena where the battle is won or lost, in the spiritual arena. Victory and defeat are rooted in the spiritual realm. The spiritual victories are brought into the natural circumstances, not the other way around. We win or lose in our relationship with God, and then we transfer that battle, the victory hopefully, it, to our relationships in the world, wherever they may be. It begins in the Spirit. In the beginning, God, go to your Bible, page 1, verse 1 of the whole book, in the beginning, God. Everything begins with God. The Spirit is the beginning. In the beginning, God. We begin at the end, we lose. We always lose. The battle is spiritual. There can be no reasoning together or walking together while we are of a different spirit. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? I said this last week. I think it's, I think it's a good philosophy. We should know this just off the tip of our tongue. In the essential things, there must be unity. We must agree that Jesus is Lord. 
if you say you can be saved in any other name, we, can, we part ways right there. We can no longer walk together. Christ, Christ only. In the essentials, salvation by grace through faith, period. You contribute nothing but your will, period. These are the essentials. We agree in these. We are unified in these. There are no exceptions. We will not consider a debate over these. In the non-essential things, we're not going to fall out with you because you have a different color hymnal, because you have a different denomination, because you baptize in some other way, because you were raised. In... These are non-essentials. These are not relevant. These are not directly defined in redemption itself. We are focused on redemption. We're not trying to fine-tune people. We're trying to get people saved. We're trying to prepare them for heaven. There'd be plenty of time in heaven for the fine-tuning. In the non-essentials, there's liberty. You have to be a mature enough Christian. If somebody says something you disagree with, you can still go around that and go on with your life. There's liberty. You say it's left, I say it's right. We agree we're in Christ. That's it. Let's move on. But in all things, but in all things, whether we agree, disagree, whatever, always love. Always love. It's the old English word charity. That word today just means the opposite, really, of love. But the word is love. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. Amen. So, in your spiritual battle, it's important not to attack the wrong enemy. The real enemy is invisible. So if you can see him, keep looking. It's not them. The real enemy has no flesh and blood. Blaming others is one of the first symptoms of the fall of Adam and Eve. That's the very, I would say the initial, or certainly one of the initial evidences of the fall is beginning to blame other people automatically. Save ourselves, blame the other person. Or I think they say in politics, throw them under the bus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they didn't have buses then, so he just, they blame. But some erroneously say Adam blamed Eve for his mistake. That's not true. It was God that he blamed. Genesis 3.12 Then the man said, the woman you gave to me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. If you hadn't given me, this would have never happened. It's not my fault. It's your fault. People would deny this when you just put it out there like I'm doing. But people blame God for everything. When God is the only innocent person who is guilty of nothing right. ever right. but good. Good all the time. God cannot be accused of evil in any way. He cannot be convicted of anything but good. God is not, God is not subjective. God is objective. God is not relative. God is absolute. God is absolute good all the time, meaning there's never a time when He is anything other than good. God who is love, is good to me whom he loves. That's your gospel. There's no other God. There's no other name. Buddha won't give you that. Mohammed won't give you that. No one else will give you that. In fact, they can't give you anything. They need Jesus the same as we do. We worship uniquely. We alone as Christians and no one else on earth worships the one and only true and living God. All other gods are false. So man blames God no matter what he says. If there's, a, if there's a hailstorm, they blame God. If there's an earthquake, they blame God. If they're late for church, they blame God. 
Some people blame the devil, but <laughs> blame shifting is as good evidence as you can ever find that you have left the path. You have fallen from the garden that God placed you in to live and thrive forever. The fight of faith is between the children of God and the children of the devil. The devil is the God of this world. Make no mistake about it. I don't have all day to lead up to that. That's the bottom line. There are two gods. The God of heaven, the God of this world. The God of this world is the father of all of those who are not the children of God. There's no one who has a third father. There are only two. Every person will spend eternity with their father. So how important is it to be with the right one? One God. One true God, the one God who created the heavens and the earth, and there is no other, no other name under heaven. Amen. Jesus said, love your enemies. So now I have a tough question. How can we fight an enemy whom we love? You say you love your brother and sister, how can you fight them then? You fight people you love. What do you do? What do you do to people you don't love? You should bring them to God. There should be nobody you don't love. There'd be plenty of people, as long as you live, whom you don't like, you may dislike, you may despise. But there's no one that you don't love. I loathe many of the things that I see in the actions and the. And I've said this plenty of times, and I, I wish I had a stronger word to use. I loathe what I see in the world around me, the abuses and the way people are treated and maligned and lied to and tricked and deceived and misled and all of this stuff. It is sickening to me. I loathe the very breath that breathes these horrific, satanic, devilish, what am I saying, propaganda. The poor, unlearned victims who have no defense against this kind of spirit of this world, the devil's world. But we are the children of God. And the reason and the only reason we are still here is for their sake. If we hate and despise them and have contentions against them, if we're not there for them, we're not here legitimately. We're here for ourselves. Christ did not come to be ministered to, but rather to minister. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. We're here to help save, not to help condemn. They're already condemned. The Bible says, he who believes in the Son is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned. They don't need us to tell them that they're condemned. They already are condemned. We don't have to prove it. They are. We are the children of God. We are here to shed the light. Hoping, hoping, praying, believing in line with God, with God's Spirit, with His plan, with our purpose for being here, to somehow lead as many as we can, as Paul said, to win as many as I possibly can. As long as I'm here, I'm willing to become all things to all people. If that's not our goal for being here, no wonder we're so miserable and always fighting someone. Jesus said, love your enemies. How can we fight an enemy whom we love? When we attack people who disagree with us, we do not advance the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly or weak, but our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our spiritual arsenal is in the heart, not in the hand. Spiritual weapon, consistency, consistency. Many Christians are too inconsistent. Here's where I offer you the six month consistency challenge. I challenge you, anyone and everyone who hasn't done this or we're still wavering perhaps in any way. Sit. Sit. Zip it. Come on. Come on. 
sit consistently for six months. You say, you don't have six months? How long did it take you to get in this mess? Mm -hmm. You don't have six months to get out? I think you do. Sure. But you'll find out it won't take near that long once you commit. Sit for six months, bring all, all your questions, all, your, all, of this, all of this drama, all of this whirling around, all of this mess. Just, just archive it for another six months and say, okay, it'll be happy to take you back if you want it back later. Don't worry. It'll be there. Just park it. Just park it, sit, and listen. All the questions that were really troubling you before, you'll see they'll be answered along the way in ways you never expected. You won't, then, you won't then reach a point where you know everything, but you will reach a point, as I say of myself, where at some point I had no further questions. Oh. I was resolved. Oh, There's no que I don't have a question in my heart about nothing, no one, anything, both now and forever, because I know all my answers are in him and I trust him with them. I don't have to worry. I don't have to know them. I just have to know that he knows them. I don't have to own the library. I just have to belong to his book club. That's all. Yes. Romans seven twenty one. Sit for six months and just listen and learn. And in six months, if, that's, if that isn't good advice to you, if that somehow has hindered your life or directed your life in some negative way, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> Romans 7, 21. I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So, from now on you won't be surprised, right? You found out there's a law. So it's always going to be... A law means always. It doesn't... The law doesn't care if you're a good Christian person. It doesn't care if you had good intentions. It doesn't care about anything. It can't tell you from anyone else. There are no exceptions to the law. It doesn't yield. It doesn't give grace. It just stands. And all who come against it, the law breaks them. No one has ever broken a law yet. The law has always broken the person who comes against it. Paul said, every time I want to do good, it seems that I end up doing the opposite. It's a law. Gravity is a law. Every time you stumble, <laughs> you risk falling to the ground. Gravity doesn't say, okay, this time we'll, we'll give you a pay. No. It's a law. It never relinquishes. But, so when I would do good, evil is right there with me. But someone else is right there with you also. Right. Hebrews 13, 5, For he himself is said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Yes. Romans 8.31, If God is for us, who can be against us? The scripture says, Paul says right after this, Paul says, I see this law, every time I would do good, the evil one is present with me. Who would deliver me from this body of death? Then in the next verse he says, Thank God through Jesus Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free or lifted me above the law of, of sin and death. So the way you defeat this law is with a higher law. The law of God is love. Always invoke the law of God which supersedes all other laws. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9 We are hard pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. You ought to be encouraged by that. You're not the minority here. You and God alone are a majority always. Consistency. Consistency is paramount to our coping abilities in life. Our capacity to handle the ups and downs in daily living without going crazy. 
consistency. The way to win is simple, very simple. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. The only one who loses is the one who is AWOL. The one who, what we used to call, what I used to call, fails to report. They didn't show up for the job. <laughs> I'll never forget those factory days. I have an assembly line starting up. I'm building one car every minute. I see three empty spots there. There's three cars that didn't get built. <laughs> you don't forget that. But when you fail to report, you fail. Stay in touch with people. We're designed to live in a, I hate to use this word kind of, but it's kind of true, a network called society. We were not created to live apart from others, but united with others because every member is a, is a part of every other member. We need each other. There's no member that we can say, I don't need this person. Oh no, there's something you need in that person and there's something they need in you. Don't withhold it, give freely. Consistency in your life is what keeps you from going crazy when circumstances change. Every time you get a flat tire, or every time you get an unexpected bill, you go crazy. What's the matter with you? This is life. You ever, been, you ever been hooked up to an EKG or a heart monitor or whatever? You see that line, what does it do? It goes up and down. When you see it flat line, You don't have, you better do something quick. <laughs> don't flatline, keep showing up. Spiritual weapon, the gospel. The main purpose of the gospel, I don't know if you ever heard it this way or not, the main purpose of the gospel is to invalidate the false gospel. Yes. That the good must outweigh the bad to be saved. Man's sin is not the issue which keeps him out of heaven. It's his birthright. Right. He has no right to be there. There's no, there's no birth certificate. He wasn't born there. He's an outsider. John 3, 3, Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born from above, born again. No one can see nor enter the kingdom of God it is a spiritual kingdom. The scripture says the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your spirit. That spirit in you that contains this kingdom of God will one day deliver you to the universal kingdom of God, the eternal one. We were born into this world by the will and the means of another. We contributed nothing. You contributed nothing to your birth. That was your mother and your father. How stupid are people who are prejudiced against other people because they feel somehow better than them? Like they had a choice, like they chose to be who they would be. These other people too dumb to make the good choice. They, you're too stupid to be among people, period. You need to be locked away somewhere until you can learn something. Anybody who looks down on anyone or up to anyone has no idea what they're doing. What is the matter with you? Our first birth, by our first birth, we belong in the earth. By our second birth, we belong in heaven. You have a right to be here. Why? You're born here. You have a right to be in heaven. Why? You're born from there. That's it. Don't make a religion out of it. That's it. Philippians 3.20 Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Acting religious is only a futile attempt to camouflage who we really are. Don't try to start behaving better, thinking now you're going to be a good Christian or you're going to evolve into one. No, no, you have to be born there. You have to start there. You can't evolve into some other species. You have to, be, you have to begin there. Instead of trying to cover up who you are, put on the cover of Christ so the world will see who He is. The way, the, the way to make Him look good is just step aside and let them see Him. That's all. We have our entire lifetime to consider what I'm telling you. But after that, the judgment. The matter then will be closed for eternity. God is waiting. He's waiting for you today. Romans 10, 13, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
why do you need further instruction? Why do you need sessions? Why do you need second opinions? Why do you need to talk to 10 people and have a Facebook poll and everything else? When, the, when Paul says directly, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved will be saved. What else do you need? What higher authority can you go to? Just do it now and be saved. Period. Nothing can stop that from happening. In conclusion, the final weapon is love. The church of Jesus Christ is a non-religious community founded on the unconditional love of God. Everything else is pure religion and is not going one inch above this ground in that day. Religion is the opposite of redemption. Redemption, Religion is the wall between God and man. Jesus is the door through that wall. What's the right ammunition for fighting the good fight of faith? Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. Love is always our weapon of choice. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. John said, if you say you love God and hate your neighbor, you're a liar. I agree with John. We may measure our love for God by the person we love the least. Love is a belief. Love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not what you think. It's not that hormonal stirring stuff. Love is absolutely real love. The love of God I'm talking about is a belief. It is a belief. You can call it a doctrine if you want. This is an absolute belief. Love is a belief. A belief that every person is of equal value to God and to me. The saying, the saying, I love you, means I believe Not that I feel something for you. Not that I'm stirred. Not that not any of this sick, silly teenage stuff. It is a profound belief in you, in your heart, that you and I are of equal value. That's love. Your worst enemy has the same value. You and he on the scale balance. The good will never outweigh the evil. They weigh the same. Jesus asked one question of us today. What can I do for you? you. Most preachers will tell you, ask God what you can do for Him. God doesn't need a thing except you. What can I do for you today? What can I do? Rather, what can you do on your own without me? (laughs) What can I... Allow Him to do for you what only He can do. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, you once who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He wants to be your Savior today. All you need to do, you don't need to, you don't need to do anything else. You don't need to talk to another person. You need to start here. Ask Jesus to be your Savior. Right now, right where you are. And I can tell you it was done a moment ago. If you believe God's Word, you will be saved. Your version of Christianity works against you. You need the truth. The truth is God's Word plus nothing, minus nothing. Jesus wants to be your Savior today. Say yes to Him right now, yes. right here, right where you are. No fear. No fear. That's right. Never again. The matter is closed. You never need to bring this subject up ever again. From this moment forward, you declare yourself a child of God because you have asked for entrance into His kingdom and He will not turn anyone down. He promises. Yes. 
There is no greater word that anyone can give you than that. Do that. Do that now. You don't have to stay here. I mean, you don't have to go home, but you cannot stay in this room. You have to go now. <laughs> Amen. So God bless you and thank you for this week. And uh, we'll see you on the Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. God bless you. Thank you again.